Good morning. Welcome to worship with St. Paul today as we gather around God's Word and hear His will for our lives. Today we're going back to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, and the key word today is love. And just lined up that way, I didn't find it like it's two days after Valentine's Day, so let's talk about love today. Uh, but today it is going to be hearing from Jesus. What does it mean to love someone? It's not a warm, fuzzy feeling always inside. It's not only I'll love you if you make me feel good. It's I'll love you even if you've wronged me. So may God be with you and me as we hear God's word this morning. The opening hymn is hymn 505.
let us pray. Gracious Father, keep your family, the church, always faithful to you, that we may lean on the hope of your promises and be strong in the power of your love. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. The scripture lessons today raise the bar to holiness, to perfection. That's what God demands. That's why we need Jesus. He came and lived in our place. He took the punishment that, that we deserve. He forgives us and loves us, and we in turn love him. And we want to be like Jesus, and, and what is it to be like Jesus? It is to love, to love God, to even love our, our, our neighbor, even our enemy. Moses speaks to us first in Leviticus chapter 19. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the entire assembly of Israel and, and say to them, Be holy, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Do not hate your brother in your heart. Re rebuke your neighbor frankly, so you will not share in his guilt. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This is the word of our God. And next here, the junior choir. I'll praise God with the anthem, Bless the Lord, O my soul.
what does a life of love look like? Paul describes it in his letter to the Romans, chapter 12. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of our God. stand in reverence to the words of our Lord. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, Jesus speaks and calls upon us to love our neighbor, even our enemy. You have heard that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. We join the sermon hymn in 493.
grace and mercy and peace to you this morning, from God our Father, from Jesus our Savior too. There are two ways that your soul can be hurt by sin. And really, pastoral care or taking care of your own soul is in large part, how do you deal with those two kinds of hurts? first kind is the hurt your own sins cause. And I hope you don't underestimate the damage that's caused to your own soul and to your relationship with God when you say, I don't care, and you go ahead and do what God says is wrong. That hurts. The answer for that kind of hurt is to confess your sin to God and find forgiveness in Jesus Christ, who died for you. That by his death on the cross, by rising from the dead, he paid the price for that, and God says that you are forgiven. Jesus heals our own sins. Second kind is hurts that have nothing to do with your sin, but come from the sin in the world around you. Satan would love to rip apart your soul. The world can hurt your soul, and the sins of other people can cause some wounds that run very, very deep. And that's the focus more this morning, is that second kind of hurt. And I'm going to assume this morning that this is something we all share in common. Actually, both kinds. That all of us have hurt our own souls with our own sin, and that all of us know what it's like to feel the pain and the hurt and the stress that comes from being hurt by the sins of other people. As your pastor, I'm getting to know you better and better, and I hope the longer I'm here, the more I do know you personally. But I'm going to assume that in the Christian church it's not so much different than what the stats say about what people face in our world. I would assume that there are some of you here this morning who were abused as kids, even by people that you trusted. I would assume this morning that some of you kids have been hurt really bad by somebody you thought was your friend. I'm going to assume that many of our married couples have experienced hurts from their spouses that they never imagined the day that they said their wedding vows. I imagine that many of you, when you go to work, you dread, who's going to come through the door? Is it my boss? Is it somebody I'm supposed to be serving today who just uncalled for is going to hurt me? There are more hurts than I could ever list. And the question is, How do you and I as God's people respond to that kind of hurt on us? Not not caused by our own sins, but hurts that are caused by the sins of others. If you'd hit a dog, the dog would probably snarl back and bare its teeth and might bite you. If you hurt a human being, the reaction is often anger and bitterness. And depending on who the person is, that can take a bunch of different forms. Some people will fight back, whether with their fists or with their words. Some people will fight back, but they'll get all passive aggressive about it. On the outside, it's a smile, have a great day, love you, but inside their hearts, it's plotting how to pay back the hurt. Some people, it's they withdraw from everyone and everything that ever hurts them. But you've probably seen how that goes. That kind of person is going to be very isolated and lonely because... So many things are going to hurt you in life, you can't get away from them all. Some people, it's more they turn the victim and they just complain and vent all day long about how horrible everybody else is to them in life. But no matter which of those routes it is, all of them share this in common. They're all like the little kids in the backseat of the car saying, He hit me first! As if we can justify our anger and resentment for others because of the hurt that we received and that led to it. But then, Jesus speaks to us in the Sermon on the Mount. If not there already, go back to page 8, as we see his words here at the end of Matthew chapter 5. Throughout the whole Sermon on the Mount, Jesus flips upside down and inside out the way that we would live if we hadn't met him. And today, there are two paragraphs here because Jesus responds to misinterpretations, twisting of two different Old Testament passages. So if you look at the first paragraph, you see the passage there from the Old Testament? You've heard it was said, passage is, 
Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. You find that in Exodus, you'll find that in Leviticus, you'll find it in Deuteronomy. It's fairly common in the Old Testament laws. The point was this, that in the Israelite court system, the punishment should fit the crime. You know how it works, right? Sometimes people want to let their buddies off the hook and have the punishment be way too little for what the crime deserved. Other times the victim wants to go all out and really punish the person way more than the crime deserved. The rule was eye for eye, tooth for tooth, the punishment fits the crime. But can you imagine how people twisted that? They were quoting that passage as their right to take revenge. If someone hurts me, I will hurt them back, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. And Jesus explains more. He says, here's what you really ought to say. He says, I tell you, do not resist an evil person. I had someone last night ask me that. Is that true? The Bible says don't resist an evil person. I thought we should resist evil. Uh, but Jesus here says, there's a sense in which you should not resist an evil person. And then the most famous line out of this whole section is the next part. Jesus says, if someone hits you in the face, turn to the other cheek. He gives other examples too. If someone would sue you and take away your one piece of clothing, give them your other one as well. And back then they didn't have a wardrobe where they could go home and put something else on. That would be all your clothes. If someone forces you to go with them one mile, go with them two, don't, don't hesitate to give to those who ask of you. In other words... How do you and I respond to hurt? Jesus says, be willing to be hurt more. Second paragraph. You see there what Jesus is reacting to. The Old Testament passage is, love your neighbor. We actually heard that from Leviticus chapter 18. The way they were twisting that one is, again, people do the same thing today. They added something. So the way Jesus quotes it, the people were saying, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. <laughs> How about that for completely destroying what God meant? To divide the whole world into two groups and say, if you're nice to me, if you like me and I like you, then I'll love you back. If you are mean to me, then watch out. Because I have a list of people I consider my enemies, and if you're on that list, I will not love you, I will hate you. Jesus says, that's never what God intended back in Leviticus. Jesus says, I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. I've got a friend who's a pastor who shared this story with me. There was a mom one night with her preteen daughter in her back seat. They needed some cash, so they drove to the bank, went through the drive through ATM. So the mom... Pulls out her card, sticks it in, punches in her number, the machine is sp spitting out some money, and then all of a sudden, somebody rushes in out of the darkness and rips the money out of her hands and runs away. And she's just frozen there for a second, both by the terror and by, again, it's, it's easy for the, the first reaction to be anger, and how could that person do that to me? And then she thinks of her daughter in the back seat, and she turns around, and her daughter says to her, Hey, Mom, how about if we pray for that person? They must really need Jesus' help. And I, you think, as far as I know, it's a true story, but who does that? Whose first reaction when they're hurt is to say, let me pray for that person because they really need Jesus' help. Jesus says, love your neighbor, but how in the world, why in the world would we ever do that? That is, seems like the exact opposite of uh, of what we would do. I think that if I were not a Christian pastor and just some kind of psychotherapist, I could give you some reasons not to harbor anger, right? It can really burn you out and use up all your emotions. Uh, holding on to anger a long time, even non-Christians recognize that can hurt you. But that's not the answer Jesus gives today. For us as Christians, why is it that you do not hold on to anger and drudges, but rather you love? That's in that second paragraph. Verse 45, you see it there? Very simply, you and I are the children of God. And we have a Heavenly Father who is perfect, and His perfect love is patient with people in a way that's very strange in this world. And God our Father calls us to be perfect like, like Him. 
And so if you think for a second about what God's love is like, I, I know there are people, and sometimes I, I'm like this too, who say, if I were God, if I were running the world, I would do it this way. And I think there are people who imagine, if I were God, if I were running the world and people did what's wrong, I would lay down the law right away and let there be consequences immediately so people would know not to do what's wrong. Uh, but if you go down that line of thinking, if God would react to every kind of evil in the world, because every sin is something done against him too, if God would react and pay back for every evil done the moment it happened, what would the world look like? I don't know what there would be that's left. Uh, so much evil done against God. So God instead, for a world that that was and still is continually and purposefully wronging him all the time, God looked at a world full of sinful people like that and said, I love them and I'm going to be patient with them and not only that, I'm going to send my son to die for them and that's what he did. That Jesus Christ came into the world to save, to save sinners. The Apostle Paul in Romans 5 says this, While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We didn't get on God's friends list before he sent Jesus Christ. The same chapter, two verses later, says this. When we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. Not when some other people were God's enemies, when we were. When we were God's enemies, God loved his enemies so much that he gave his son to die for us. And that is why Jesus today can call us the children of God. That is why you have forgiveness and life in heaven because God said he was going to love his enemies who hurt him. And God's love like that hasn't stopped. So Jesus in verse, the, actually the same verse, verse 45 at the end, Jesus gives two examples about how God's patient love is still bearing with people who sin against him. And you see it every day. First example, you see it there, what did God do this morning, no matter if you are good or bad, evil or one of his children, what did God do? God made the sun come up. Uh, and the second example is when God makes it rain, he doesn't like set borders. So if you're on his good list, his friends list, it'll rain on your field. And if you're sinning against God and his enemy, then you won't have any rain. Uh, I could, wouldn't you imagine setting something like that up if you're God? Uh, then it only rains on the people who are good to you. Uh, but God doesn't do that. God sends his goodness, the sun rises, the rain falls on the righteous and the unrighteous, on those who love God and those who hate him. God patiently bears with them because that is part of the perfect father that we have in heaven, is a perfect, patient love. And if my father in heaven can be that patient with me and with this world, then I want to be patient and bear with others in love because I want to be like my Father in heaven. And yet that raises some questions in my mind, maybe yours too. Won't I be taken advantage of that? How long should a Christian put up with an abusive or situation where a Christian keeps getting hurt again and again again. What do you do when you feel like you're trapped in something like that? And if you feel this that way this morning, if you feel like you are trapped in a relationship or a situation where there's another person who keeps sinning against you and hurting you again and again and again, I feel for you. That's not what God intended for this world to be like. It's part of the way sin has wrecked everything. And if right now you are feeling that kind of hurt again and again and again, usually there are ways you can reach out and ask for help. If you don't know what that is, you feel like you're stuck, then reach out to somebody and, and, and get some help. But when is it that you bear with somebody in love? When is it that you move away and say, no, I, I'm not, I'm not going to take that? That's one of the things you're going to have to wrestle with as you apply God's love to your life. An example I see in the lives of these disciples, so the apostles were sitting at Jesus' feet for the Sermon on the Mount. Within a few years, they were putting this into practice in the early Christian church. There were times when the apostles turned the other cheek and took in a lot of hurt and abuse, 
even laid down their lives for the sake of the gospel? Are there times when Christian love means that you will bear with somebody a lot longer than somebody else might have? Yeah. Were there times when the apostles fled the persecution and left it behind and went to live another day and preach Christ in a different place? Yeah, they did that sometimes too. Might there be some times when you say, it's not right now that I need to stay in this situation where I keep getting hurt again and again and again. The thing that's, that's clear, though, what Jesus says is, the thing that ought to drive us is not anger, it is love. That when you bear with somebody, it's because of, because of love. If you'd ever say, I need to switch jobs, or last week Jesus talked about how divorce is not God's plan. But as you go through all these different situations in life, if there's a time when it is time to leave, it's not because I'm angry or I can't take it, it's because that also is the loving thing to do. And in no situation should you be staying or leaving so you can hurt the other person back. And in no case should you be allowing your own heart to marinate in that poisonous brew of anger and bitterness and revenge. Jesus says, love your neighbor just like your heavenly Father loves, loves them too. And that's going to make us different from this world. Because I look at this world and our American culture too, and people recognize that you can go over the top with anger, that being too angry is a bad thing. But my sense is that most people would allow a certain amount of anger and a certain amount of retaliation as natural and as right. And that concerns me. Let me give you one example. My, my son has been asking me what I think of the Harry Potter series, because he's been reading it. It seems like all the kids are reading that. Uh, I read it for the first time myself last summer. I find the story and the uh, whole thing very engaging. Uh, are there concerns I have? Yeah. The magic and witchcraft, that'd be on the list. But if I'd have to pick one concern I had after reading the Harry Potter series, it'd be this. That a lot of the characters, including the good ones like Harry, they act out of anger and about getting back at the people who hurt them earlier in life. And it concerns me if we as Christians allow from our culture this to rub off on us, the idea that anger and getting back at people is normal. I suppose the truth is, it is normal and natural if you look at the point of view of our sinful nature. But that isn't natural or normal for who we are and who God has created us to be as his children in Christ Jesus. Jesus says, love your neighbor. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And that call to have a perfect love like my Father in heaven, first of all, is a call for me to repent because I need to confess the sin that I, I am not perfect like him. I have not loved that way. And it gives me and you something to strive for today. I want my love even more to imitate his love and his patience even when I get hurt. So circling back to the beginning, there are two ways... You can be hurt by sin, and both of those find their answer in Jesus Christ our Savior. And it's not, you might be hurt these ways, it's, you better expect it and be ready for it. Both your own sins and the sins of others. It's going to happen in the sinful world. For your own sins, I hope that you do not turn into that kind of hypocrisy. I've heard this from people where they blame everything on the sins of others. Nothing's my fault. I'm angry at everybody else for how they've wronged me. Honestly, recognize your own sins. Confess that to Christ and find forgiveness in Him. On the other side, when people do hurt you and sin against you, what do you do? Even if nobody else in the whole world knows what you are feeling and how much it hurts, God knows and He cares about you. He's put people around you to help you through it. Some of those would be us as your pastors. Can we take away every hurt or fix every wrong in life? No. Can we apply God's grace to your heart 
and help you find what it means, what the path is and the strength is to keep loving people and bearing with people even when it's hard? Yeah. There are some couples here at St. Paul right now, we're counseling them in their marriages because they're going through some really hard times where they've hurt each other. There have been members of St. Paul's who have felt so hurt by the stuff in this world that they've thought about ending their own lives. And I don't know what the hurt is for you, but if we as your pastors can help you with God's grace through it, uh, reach out. That's one of the reasons that we're here for you. But whether it's through us or others, find the answer in God's grace in Christ Jesus. He loves you so much that he died for you. His grace and his love are going to get you through. And his love for you is going to enable you to love other people even when it's really hard. Amen. Let's rise and confess our faith in Christ this morning. This morning, let's sing our confession of faith using the song, We Praise You, O God, on pages 9 and 10. as we bring the Lord our offerings. I invite you now to sign the friendship register that's booklet by the aisles. Let us know you're here this morning, and if there's anything we can do for you, check one of the boxes there.
Please stand. Our service continues with, continues with the response of Kyrie and prayer. <coughs> Your faithfulness, O Lord, I call to you. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. Almighty God. Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we praise you for reconciling us to yourself through the sufferings and death of your dear Son. Through him we have confidence to enter into your presence and to bring you our prayers and petitions. Out of the infinite bounty of your goodness, grant us a rich measure of your spirit. Let the love of Christ fill your church so that it may flourish in all good works. Help us show love and compassion for all who are in need bestow on the nations of the earth the knowledge of your mercy that they may turn to you the only God and find salvation in you strengthen our faith so that we unfailingly come to you in prayer for all our bodily needs give a special measure of your power to those who are sorrowful or mourning to those who are in pain or sickness to those who may be in temptation or peril that they may receive your blessed aid and help us patiently endure any chastising and afflictions you permit to come into our lives, knowing that you are using them in love to prepare us for that joyful communion with you, which is ours for all eternity. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon Michael Hoffman and Abigail Erdman, who were united in marriage here before your altar yesterday. Go with them to guide them with your word, to comfort them with your promises, and to strengthen their reliance on you. May your love for them in Christ overflow in a love that they have for each other that grows daily and, and year after year. Now, dearest Lord, we come before you and give you our personal petitions. Accept our prayers and intercessions and provide for all our needs, not because we are worthy, but for the sake of Jesus our Savior, who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us safely to this new day. Defend us with your mighty power, and grant that this day we neither fall into sin nor run into any kind of danger. And in all we do, Direct us to what is right in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Let us praise the Lord. Praise be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. You may be seated as we join in the closing hymn, 479.
let's take a moment to tune into the Wells Connection, and this, this month will be about the new hymnal project, believe it or not, that red hymnal that sits in the pew, although some of them look like it, is 26 years old. And so in 2021, uh, we'll, we'll learn a little bit more about the new hymnal project that we presented to the congregation.
we had some of the hymnal uh, at the leadership conference we, were, we attended uh, introduced to us too. We worshiped using some of the new settings. Um, the Psalter he's talking about, and each Psalm, 140 of them, or 150 of them, will have four different settings for each one, so you can chant it, you can sing it melodically, so it'll offer variety among all those things. And if you want to learn more about this, on March 8th, uh, between services, we have kind of a flex time, and we're not we're switching classes. For the adults, we'll gather in here and, and give you a lot more information, discuss more about the hymnal that's coming in 2021. So March 8th, mark your calendars. Um, also, uh, we do have an opportunity, if, if, when we move to the new sanctuary, we're going to need more help with videoing the services. A lot of people use that, and it's getting to be even more of an important tool that we can get out with what we proclaim here. And so if you're interested at all in helping on the video side of things, there's a workshop coming up that you can attend in uh, the week from Saturday. Just contact one of the pastors, let us know if you're interested, we'll get you the information you need to help in that, that growing ministry that we're going to have expanded when we get the new sanctuary. Also, there's regular Bible study, Sunday school, there's the different uh, classes going on for adults, there's several options there. And during this time, there's going to be some tours of the new uh, facility, too, if you're inclined. I'm going to let Mike introduce that to you. Good morning, everyone. I have a few announcements I'd like to make before we go on the tours, and I'd certainly like to invite all everyone that's here to go on those tours, guests, visitors, family, children. We have the areas pretty well marked off out there uh, with kind of some caution tape, so we just ask that you would stay within that caution tape, keep your children within that caution tape, and uh, everything should remain pretty safe and orderly. There'll be someone directing traffic out there so that everyone moves in the same direction. I think that will help it flow a little bit easier as well. There are some chairs and cones out there. We ask that you would uh, leave those in place. They are covering some things on the floor and uh, just to keep the, the walkways as uh, safe as possible. And there is also some construction materials and equipment out there. We ask that you would avoid those. There are some, a few cords on the floor. We do have those taped down, but please uh, keep your eyes open for those as well. We do have some renderings uh, like this of the interior of the building that are on the music stand out here. Um, please grab one of these renderings, one per family. It'll really help you visualize the different spaces. Right now it's, it's in a drywall stage and the ceiling and of course the, the flooring isn't on, but it'll really help you visualize what that space is going to look like when it's finished. So when you leave here, just take the hallway right outside and uh, go through the doors uh, right down the hallway here into the new area. It'll be looped. The, uh, the tape is in a way that you'll loop through the building. Certainly walk through there. If you want to loop through again, go ahead and do that. But uh, then as you exit the area, it is a bit dusty. It's a construction area. There's plenty of mats there. Please wipe your feet off on the mats before you enter back into the building and, uh, and enjoy the tours. And again, I'd like to encourage everyone to go through. And if you think it's awesome on the outside, I uh, think you'll be extremely impressed with how it looks on the inside as well. Thanks. Mike, before you go, can you just give a note about so people going to Bible study? I know that's starting pretty soon. Can you sure. explain how that's going to work? Sure. So those of you that uh, are going to attend Bible study right away will continue to offer tours uh, after you know 1030, after the second service starts. And if you want to mingle out there for a little bit before you tour, go ahead. We'll be, it, it's really, it, it's a walkthrough for you. So go ahead and walk through anytime you want. If you want to walk through immediately after church, that's great. But we'll be out there um, until at least probably 11 o'clock. So just uh, walk through when it works best for you. And then we'll offer tours again after the second service. And it's very comfortable in there. It's uh, at least, I would say, 65 degrees in there. So you don't need to put your coat on before you go in there or anything. You'll also notice when you go in there that we're not going to have to put chairs in the gym anymore. There'll be adequate seating, which is going to be outstanding when the children sing. And I want to thank the, the kids, too. did an ex exceptional job, too. That was a difficult song to, to do and it sounded wonderful so thank you very much thank you parents for bringing them thank you visitors for being with us here today if there's anything else we can do please let us know may god bless you throughout the week and give you opportunities to love